For the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about one of the most important topics, I believe, that the Bible talks about. And um, we're going to be talking about a, a character in the Old Testament by the name of Moses. Moses clearly was one of the most influential people of the Old Testament. If it wasn't for Moses and what he has done by leading uh, his people out of Egypt, we would not be who we are. There would not be an Israel. We would not have our church, we wouldn't be where we are today. So Moses had, we're not on defining moments, but Moses had a defining moment within his life at the burning bush experience. At the burning bush experience in, in, Exod, in Exodus chapter 3, uh, Moses' life was divided up into three phases. The first phase, his 40 years, he was, he was a big somebody. He lived in Pharaoh's house, and, and for 40 years, he was the man. And then uh, some things took place in Moses' hands that, that he left Egypt and he went out into the desert for 40 years. He became an absolute nobody on the backside of a desert. And at about 80 years old, God did something supernatural. He showed up into Moses' life in a, in a bush. Moses saw a bush that was on fire but yet not consumed. And out of that bush, God spoke. And Moses heard God's voice. And right at the start, Moses tried to come to him. And God said, no, 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 no. You are in the presence of God. Take off your shoes. Show respect. You are on holy ground. Moses took off his shoes. And he bowed before this God, this burning bush. God spoke to him. He said, I have heard the cries of my people, and you are going to deliver them. And in chapter 4, Moses started to say, what if they don't believe me? What if they won't listen to me? What if they will say, I haven't heard from you? What, what am I going to do? And God says, I am sent you. He says, he says what do I do? I, I don't have the abilities. I don't, I don't have the voice. I, 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 don't, I can't articulate. And out of the burning bush... God said something. He says, what is it that's in your hand? And Moses was a shepherd. So what he had in his hand was a shepherd stock, a rod. He looked at it and he said, I just have my rod. I just have my shepherd's stick. God in the burning bush says, throw it down. Give it to me. Moses said, this is all I have. It's yours. And when he threw it down, it became a live snake. A live, breathing organism that was moving. And then God said, pick it up. Moses reached down and picked it up by the tail, and it became a rod. Moses said, I don't really truly understand what this is all about. But let me give you the application. Whatever that you have, Whatever God wants to use of yours, give it to him. Throw it on the ground. When God says, I want your influence, I want your life, throw it on the ground. And when you give it to God, it becomes a living, breathing, live instrument in God's control. When you give whatever you have and you give it to God, God can change and move in miraculous ways that you could never do it. In Moses' hand, it was a shepherd's stick. In God's hand, it became the rod of God. Whatever God did, whatever Moses wanted to do, God used that rod of God to change the world, to part the Red Sea, to bring water out of a rock. That rod was not just a shepherd's stick after Moses gave it to God. It was God's hand. The influence that Moses had because of that burning bush experience is overwhelming. Moses left the backside of the desert. He went back to Egypt and he led captives free. In the Bible, there's main characters and there's main things that flow throughout the Bible. The first one is salvation. And in the Old Testament, when you would ask anybody in the Old Testament, what is, what is the Bible all about? What is God all about? He would, he would say salvation. He, he led Israel out of captivity into freedom. God saved them. 
In the New Testament, you would say God saved us because of the cross. In the Old Testament, it was always about what Moses did through God's hand to lead his people out. God saved them. But he also talks about stewardship. Stewardship in our life. What is it that you have that you don't even know God wants to use? And God is saying, whatever you have, whatever is yours, whatever I can use, if you give it to me, it will work. If you give my kids, I can take them. If you give me your resources, I will make it alive. If you give me your talents, I can move them and use them. If you give me your life, it will not be just a dead life. I can take it and I can move it and I can make it and I can become what you really want. But when we have a shepherd stick, our talents, our gifts, what do they mean? Well, Moses' rod identified in three different areas. Number one, it was his identity. He was a shepherd. So a shepherd's had a shepherd's crook. It was his wealth because at that day they didn't have money. They had stock. They had livestock. They had cattle. They had sheep. They had uh, whatever, whatever they raised, but it was livestock. And, and that's why in Proverbs it says, take heed of thy flock. Make sure you number your flock. Make sure you take care of your flock. But it also talked about his influence. Talk about his influence. Moses, no doubt, was the biggest leader of the Old Testament. What do we have that we can use for our leadership, for our influence? Whatever you have, God wants to use. And all you have to do is ask a couple questions. Where is it? Is it available? And is it within reach? What do I have that's available to me that I can give back to God? When you look at the scriptures in uh, Exodus chapter 4, then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, what is in your hand? And he said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. Sometimes we do not do what God has asked us to do because we're scared of what God can do. Sometimes we don't give our kids to God because we're afraid what God is going to do. Sometimes we don't give our resources to God because we don't know what we are going to do. And we get scared of what God can do. So we run from the very thing that God wants us to do. And when we run from the thing that God wants us to do, then what we have, we become afraid. We run. And God says, stop. Stop running. The thing that I'm going to bless you with, you have to reach down and you have to pick it up. You have to try it. If we do not try what God wants us to do, we will never have what God wants us to have. Give it to God. Stop. Quit running. Turn around and say, this is, this is what God wants for me. Is it scary? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Al and I were talking. We saw a snake this week, and we said, well, we hate snakes. Anybody like snakes? Oh, you guys are crazy. You guys are crazy. If I, I, I will lose 12 balls before I'll go find a ball in the, in the water, I guarantee you, because I hate snakes with a passion. But the serpent, Moses ran. God said, stop, pick it up. And I guarantee you, the thing that you're afraid of the most, God wants you to embrace the most. If it's your marriage, if it is your resources, if it is your kids, if it's your job, what is it? What is it that you're, you're scared about? What is it that you need to give to God? What is it you say, I need to do this. I need God to take care of this. I have to have God take care of it. And we give it to him. And then he asked us to do something that, ah, uh, no, nah, no, 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 no. I would rather go back to what I know than to do something that I'm scared about. And God is saying the same thing he said to Moses. He said, when you give it to me, it will become alive. It'll be something that is out of your control. And I want you to know, when you give it to me, it's not, it's not yours. This was the last time that the staff was Moses' staff. From this point on, in the rest of the Bible, it became the rod of God, not Moses' staff. Once you give whatever it is to God, whatever your influence is, whatever your resources are, 
You give it to God, God will never allow it to be the same again. And God puts power, authority, and life into what you have. There's two things we talked about. Salvation. Your life is dead without God. Period. You can live your life and without Jesus being the Lord of your life, you are living a dead life, and there's no power in your life without God. If you've never given your life to Christ, you are going through the motions of your life, you're coming, you're searching, but God cannot take you and move you and make you alive and give you hope and give you the thrill of life until you give your life to God. And then once you give your life to God, your life becomes something that's real, a purpose. Life enters your heart because you give your life to God. Salvation is the number one thing that God wants for all of us. And he says, give me your life. Throw your life down at me and let me pick it up and let me give to you something that you can't have on your own. One of the biggest things that we need and that we have in our life is influence. We talk about our salvation. But after our salvation, influence. The first thing I say, who influenced you the most? Automatically in your mind, somebody comes to your mind whether it's your mother or your father, maybe it's a coach or a teacher, somebody came to your mind that said, I influenced you. Or you would say, who are you the biggest influencer of? Who have you influenced the most? The reason the sermon came to my mind this week was, as last week was my birthday. And on, on some of the birthday cards, it said, thank you for being the church's influence. Thank you for influencing my life. I had two or three cards that had the word influence on that, and I thought, you know, you, you go through this thing, and you think about pastoring, you think about leading, you think about being in the church, you don't necessarily think about the influence you have in somebody's life, whether it's a positive or a negative influence, but we all have influence, don't we? Whether it's good or bad, but we all influence other people's lives. So I, I started studying and looking about influence, and I want to give you some principles uh, that Moses gave to us, um, the principles of influence for God. The first, everybody has influence. Everybody has influence. You choose to use it for good or bad. If you use it for the glory of God, it will be good. But not every time that you have influence, you use it for the good, and you can cause harm for the cause of Christ if you do not use your influence for the right cause. How easy your influence can waver when you do not focus on what God wants us to focus on. What is the easiest way to influence? I'll tell you. You walk into somebody that's having a bad day, smile at them. Smile at them. You know what you get back? A smile. But you give them anger, what do you get back? You get an attitude back. The easiest way to influence somebody is when you're walking and when you're talking, make sure that they know there's something different within your life. You know, the calamities could take place within your life. You could have all kinds of problems within your life. But God doesn't change. He's in your heart. So when you're walking at the hospital or when you're walking at work and, and you have a smile on your face and you're talking to people and you're encouraging one another, people can see that there's a difference within your soul. It doesn't mean calamity's not taking place. It doesn't mean we don't have problems within our life. That means we can influence other people in spite of where we are. We all have influence. Good or bad, we all have influence. Now, influence is not about you. Influence isn't meant to serve you. If you're using influence for selfish purposes to get what you want, what you're doing is you're using and not serving. Influence is, this is what God wants to use me for. I'm not influencing somebody for my gain. I want to influence people for God's glory. Ask yourself, why and what do you want influence for? When you figure out why you want influence, you'll find out what God wants to do within your life. Who do you want to influence? Do you want to influence your kids? Do you want to influence work? Do you want to influence school? Do you want to be a positive role model in places? Why? Is it so you can be lifted up, or can you glorify God in your influence? Now, influence is stewardship. This means that I don't own myself and I don't own my influence. I just manage my influence for the cause of Christ. It changes the way that we respond to negativity within our life. You know, in Matthew chapter 12, it says we're going to give an account for every word 
and every action that we perform. We're going to give an account. In my role as a pastor, I'm going to give an account for everything that I've ever said from this pulpit. I'm going to give an account for every word that I say and every action that I perform because I am supposed to be your influencer. I'm supposed to be your pastor. I'm supposed to be your shepherd. I'm supposed to have my shepherd stick, and I'm supposed to lead you and guide you and to give to you spiritual maturity and give to you the very words of God. If I am doing this for my own good, I am going to give an account for that one day, just like you with your kids, just for your, in your marriage. You're going to give an account for every action and every word that you say. It is influence. Purpose of influence is to speak up for those who have no influence. It, we call, this is the Mother Teresa syndrome. Mother Teresa spent her life serving the ill, the ones that had no money. She served her life with people that had no influence. And because she served and gave her life of no influence, she became very influential to those with influence. It's what God does. When you have nothing, you give what you have to God, it becomes a living organism, and God can change it and serve it and make it even better than you could ever have it on your own. So whatever it is that you have, service, my influence, is, is, is not mine. It's a testimony that I have. It's what I give away. If I give it away, it doesn't cost me anything, but it costs somebody everything. The purpose of influence is to speak up for those who have no influence. Uh, Proverbs 31.8 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Influence is, who do I hang with? Am I doing things for my own good, or am I doing things for people that need help? When I look and I serve and I use my influence to help somebody, to encourage somebody, to pray for somebody, to lift somebody up, I'm using my influence, my position, to serve, not to gain. And when we do that, God can, he can take what we have given to him, lay it on the ground, make it become alive. The way up is down. John the Baptist said, I must decrease so he can increase. The way up is down. The most powerful place that you could ever be in your life is on your knees before God, asking God to change your life. Because when we humble ourselves and we pray and we seek God's face, we are saying, Lord, I can't do this. Whatever it is that I need to give to you, I can't do it on my own because when I'm standing up and I'm prideful, it's me. But when I kneel down before you, say, Lord, I need you. I can't do this without you. And we give our influence, our authority, our power away. It becomes something that God can use and transform and change. Many of you, and I know this because many of you have talked to me, we've had some problems with kids before. Some issues, maybe rebellion, maybe it's even grades, maybe it's even bigger things than that. And we come in the office and we talk. And of course, I would like to say, well, if you do this, this, and this, everything's going to work out great. But you know the only answer I can give to anybody when they have rebellious kids or troubled kids, you have to pray about it. You have to give those kids to God. The only way that we're going to survive being a parent is not control. Many, many of you say, well, I'll just control everything. Well, you, you can't. You can try. Bottom line, those kids are in some time in your life are not going to be under your control. And you must give them to God and trust that God is going to take care of them. Even when they're five or when they're 18, they have to be under God's control. We have to give them to God and allow God to take care of them. The pathway to influence is service. The pathway to influence is service. How I, how I gain influence in, in your life, in my family's life, is to serve. Not I need not tell you what you should do, not dictate influence, because if somebody dictates influence, they are not truly an influencer. The way that you gain influence in somebody's life is to serve them. Serve them. Just find out what they need. Find out how we can help them. For every one book on servanthood, 
there's 10 books on leadership. Everybody wants to be a leader. Nobody wants to be a servant. And a servant is somebody that just says, it's not about me. It's I want to get into somebody's life. There's people in our lives that just need somebody to love them. Be that influence. Be that influence in their life. And then the cause of influence is trust. The cause of influence is trust. You serve somebody, but how do they end up trusting you? Is when you have influence in them. If people trust you, you'll have influence with them. If they do not trust you, you will not have influence. The difference between, okay, let's, let's use this. Um, somebody beats his wife. Mark, I'm, I'm going to get into your life here now. Mark Scott, one of our deacons, uh, they came into counseling a couple weeks ago, and Mark just, he, he's beating Debbie up. And uh, he, he hit her a couple times, and, and uh, she gave me black eyes, and, and, and I said, okay, let's come in and talk about this. So we came in and talked about it, and Mark says, Mark says, Debbie, will you please forgive me? And Debbie goes, I will forgive you. And then, Mark, you're forgiven. And then Mark goes, can I move back into the house? Oh, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> I will forgive you, but I will not trust you. Trust has to be earned. Forgiveness is grace. I grace you, I will forgive you, but I am not going to trust you. Trust has time on its app. Now, if you date her for another five years and you don't hit her again, you may be able to move back into the house because trust takes time. Forgiveness is grace. And when we look at our influence, we can lose our influence. We can say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I said that. I'm sorry I've done that. And you may forgive me, but that doesn't mean I keep my influence over you. You are going to say, you know what? Uh, I'm going to trust someone else. I'm going to listen to somebody else's influence until I can trust in your influence. So influence is something that's very, very, very important, but it causes trust. And it takes trust. And then the price of influence is criticism. The price of influence is criticism. Have, have, have you noticed anymore that uh, Facebook is instantaneous? Social media, you can say something and you can push click and you say, oh, why did I say that? Or you could hear somebody say something and you say, why did they say that? What, what, what is wrong with them? I wish we could have a filter that has a 30-minute window by the time you say click to the time somebody can see it, and you may be able to delete it, but most people can't. Social media is instantaneous, and it takes forever to get rid of, and just because somebody says it doesn't mean it is true. The problem with influence is you are going to be criticized. You're going to be looked at. You're going to be observed. And you may not be liked to some people, but influence is not sheltered. When you have influence, people can look and people can criticize every area of your life. Now, how do we know that? Well, Jesus even said, they didn't love me and they're not going to love you. In John chapter 15, verse 18, this is my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. When you show that you're my disciple. Not everybody's going to like what you do, and they're going to criticize the things that you do. But if you want to have a man of influence, you have to understand that God is going to take care of you every area of your life. The eighth thing, the church role, is to help others use their influence. Our job is to influence others. My job is to influence you. My, my main job is to, to motivate you. My main job is to disciple you and to teach you and to love you and to encourage you and to pray for you. But my job is not to just have a church full. My job is to take you from where you are and influence other people to do what God wants you to do. Influence. Influence others to be an influence within their life. Influence within your kid's life. Influence at work. Influence. Our job at the church is to influence you to influence others. If we can do that, the church leader's role is to empower you whether you work in the nursery or work in the youth department or, or in the choir or in any ministry of the church, is to influence others to come closer to God. Now, the catalyst of influence is faith. The Bible says it is impossible to please God without faith. I, I didn't please God a lot this week. There's a lot of things that I did this week that was not in faith. It was because I wanted to do it. 
And the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. According to your faith, it will be done unto you. What we need to do in our influence is say on a daily basis, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Who is it that you want me to talk to? How can I minister to somebody? And Lord, give me the ability through faith to say, I can do this. I want to do this. I have to do this. And if it's impossible to please God without faith, every step that I take, I want to be pleasing to you. I've got to honor you in my faith. You know, even the, the parable of the talents. God gave, uh, the, the owner gave one man 10 talents and he went out and invested it and made 10 talents. And he said, well, well done, good faithful servant. And he gave another guy one talent and the guy was scared. So he went and buried it and he didn't get anything for it. And, and uh, the owner came back to him and said, you're a wicked an unfaithful steward. You could at least put it in the bank and gained interest. So whatever God has given to us in our hand, whatever it is that we have in our hand, we need to throw it down and invest it to the cause of Jesus Christ. We have to invest it. And if we do not take risks, we will never be found faithful. Taking risks are tough. You know, when I throw something on the ground, whatever God has given to me, and I say, okay, God, I want you to use it, I, it's not in my control anymore. I have to take a risk that I have to trust God that he's going to use me in the way that I can be used. But God knows me better than I know myself. And God will never ask me to do something that he cannot or he will not take over. He's not going to make me do something that I cannot do. He will empower me to do anything that he wants me to do. My rod, I'm going to throw it down. My life, my influence... My resources, I'm going to throw it down. If I want my life, my family, my resources to become alive, to do something that's supernatural, I can't keep it in my hand. I can't keep it. I can't do what I can do. But when I throw it down and God takes it over, it becomes alive. How many of you guys need a life? How many of you want your family to be alive? How many people want your prayer life to be alive? You want your job to be something that's unique? You're tired of the schmuck life? You want something that God can change. Throw it down and say, God, I need you. I want you. It causes faith. It's a lot of work, but the greatest thing that it can do, it can be the catalyst of influence within your life. The catalyst is influence of your life. And when you have influence and your faith is so alive, God can do great and wonderful things. Well, the reward of wise influence is more influence. What do you do with this influence? In Luke chapter 16, verse 10, it says, whoever can be trusted with the very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with the very little will also be dishonest with much. We may be talking about relationships. We could be talking about finances. We could talk about your wealth. We could talk about your education. We could talk about your job. We could talk about your kids. But when you do not give God the little things, you cannot be trusted with the big things. And God says this, I want to make your life alive. What is in your hand? Give it to me. Let it become a living, breathing organism that I can change. And what did Moses do? Moses changed the world because of this defining moment. If Moses looked at that burning bush experience and said, Lord, I can't talk, and Lord, I don't know if I want to do that, and Lord, I'm not going to throw this rod on the ground, or Lord, I'm not going to pick this rod back up. I'm, I'm going to walk away. I'm happy. I'm 80 years old. I'm on the backside of the desert. I'm going to take care of my, my father-in-law's sheep, and I'm just, I'm just going to be happy. God would say, I'll find somebody else. Somebody else. But I have prepared you. I've broken you. For 40 years, you were somebody for the last 40 years, you have been a zero nobody. But the next 40 years, you're going to be the most powerful person in the world when you do what I ask you to do. What's in your hand? It's a staff. I just take the sheep and I pull the sheep to me or I prod the sheep. I take them to green pastures. I, I just influence the sheep where they need to go. And I use this rod, this shepherd's staff. That's all I have. That's my tool of influence. That's what I have. That's what I can do. Not much. Give it to me. Well, if I give it to you, well, how am I going to do what I'm supposed to do? 
Throw it on the ground. He throws it on the ground. I don't have anything. My sheep, I can't do anything. He says, pick it up. That snake? That, you want me to pick up that snake? And God is saying, it's not a snake. It's my power. And you want power? Throw what you have at your disposal in God's hand. And see what God can do with what you have given him. If you're struggling, throw it on the ground. Give it to God. He may ask you to do something that you don't know what to do. You may have to pick up something that you don't know how to pick it up. But God's power is in the disposal of your control. When you don't know what to do, God can do it. When you're, when you're confused, give it to God. The way up is down. On your knees before God with holy hands saying, Lord, I just need you. I just need you. I need you to take care of me. The greatest way to get influence is give your influence away. And how you give your influence away is say, Lord, I just need you. I just need you. Moses became the biggest influencer in the world because of a defining moment that he met God face to face. Face to face, in the presence of God, God said, I want you. I need you. I need you to do for me something that's so important. I've heard the cry of my people. They're in captivity. I need you to let them go. The plagues, the 40 years of wandering, every place that Moses went, God provided. You're saying, I don't know if I can do it or not. I don't, I don't know if God will take care of me or not. Every time that we give what we have to God, God multiplies it, takes it, moves it, and uses it. So where is it and what is it in your hand that you're struggling with, that you need to give it to God? Is your marriage struggling? Is your finances struggling? Are your kids struggling? Would it be your health? Is it struggling? What about your insecurities? What about your failures? What about your needs? If there's something in your hand that's keeping you from doing what God wants you to do, it's keeping you from being the influence God wants you to be. And if I can't be the influence that God wants me to be, what I must do is I must trust God. Give him my heart. Give him my life. That shepherd staff meant it's salvation. It means it's my insecurities. It's my wealth. It's my identity. Give it to God. We are going to take the next three or four weeks and we're going to talk about how to be an influence. The greatest influence in my life, of course, was Jesus. And if I did not have Christ as my salvation, I would not have anything else. The burning bush experience for me was when I met Jesus Christ for the very first time. And when I met Jesus... And he changed my heart. He changed my life. He changed my influence. He changed everything about me. He changed the direction of my life. He changed the joy of my heart. When I met Christ, everything changes. So the biggest influencer in your life, I challenge you, you must have Jesus. It doesn't do any good to live your life without Christ. He wants to change your life. He is our biggest influence. Now, in our present day life, we have some influencers. And I challenge you to be that influence. To be that influence for somebody. To encourage somebody that's been an influence to you. Write them a note. Write them a card. Tell them thank you for what they have done. These next three or four weeks, our whole time is going to be, who is your biggest influence? And how can I be an influence to you? When we can answer that question, we can change the way people perceive Jesus and perceive you. And it gives you an influence to change their life. So, let me wrap this up. Jesus. He is your biggest influence. Whether you've accepted him or not, he's still the biggest influence in our culture today. He is the only way that we can have life. And he's the only way that he can change our life. We must accept him 
and to give him our heart, to throw our life down to him. That is our biggest influence. Now, when he says, what is in your hand, that is your influence. That is what you have. That's your, your identity. What are you going through? What are you struggling with? What do you have problems in? Give it to him. It becomes a living, breathing instrument at God's disposal. I love it. The staff of Moses, thrown on the ground, became the rod that God used for the next 40 years. Because he allowed him to have it. So, if you're struggling, what are you holding on to? What is God saying? What is in your hand? What is in your hand that you're holding on to so tight that you say, I'm not going to let this go. I, I know he wants me to. I know that I should. But I can't. We have to be like Moses. There it is. Throw it on the ground. Let God supernaturally change it. And then pick it up. And let the power of God change your life. Our invitation is simple. Number one, you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You cannot have the power of God until you first see who Jesus is and accept him for what he's done for you. He's forgiven you. He has forgiven you. All we have to do is accept that forgiveness. And then in your life, your struggles, bow on your knees before God. Give your problems to him. Let him transform your life. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. Lord, we need you for our salvation. There's no other way to get to heaven except through Jesus Christ. We know that. We accept that. Many of us have accepted you as our Lord and Savior and as the biggest influence within our life. We thank you for that. But there's many of us here that have struggles of giving you things in our life. And you know our hearts. We cannot list as many things that we have in this church that struggles. So Lord, but you know each and every one of us. So right now, I even ask you right now to tug at our hearts and allow the Holy Spirit of God to bring into our remembrance the things that we need to give back to you. And Lord, you have promised us that you will empower us. You'll give us strength. You'll give us the ability to serve you, to be the influence around us to allow you to influence us the most of anything. So Lord, be with us. Protect us and honor us as we give this invitation to you. A time for your people to throw on the ground what's in our hand and allow you to make it alive, to change us, to be who you want us to be. We ask you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. Will you please stand to your feet in opportunity what are you clenching on to? What are you needing God to change? If you would, just be honest with before God and give it to him and let God start the great miraculous work of his power. I am broken at your feet Like an alabaster jar 